welcome all. We, we must start on time because we must end on time, else the balloons will drop on all of us. Uh, I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. I'm the faculty director of the Harvard Colloquium on International Affairs. Uh, this is a university wide colloquium uh, on international affairs with over uh, 20 school centers and panels, all sponsoring, uh, school centers and programs, all sponsoring panels. My only function uh, here this evening is to say one or two very kind words about our provost, because I know he won't say them about himself. Uh, Harvey Feinberg uh, is uh, stepping down this summer. He has been a wonderful provost, and one of the things that he has made a centerpiece of his uh, tenure with uh, Neil Rudenstein has been to encourage inner faculty initiatives. This is an inner faculty initiative par excellence. Uh, over 25 uh, faculty members engaged in one way or another. And frankly, we could not have done it without the provost sponsorship. Uh, so before he introduces our speaker, uh, I wanted to thank him uh, on behalf of the colloquium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. I was reminded of the time I was uh, asked by a friend uh, to uh, introduce him, and uh, uh, I was told by others that uh, I'd have only three minutes to say everything good about him. So I called him back and I said, you know, I only have three minutes. I have three minutes and I've got to say everything good about it. How am I ever going to do it? He said, I understand the problem. What in the world are you going to say those last two minutes? <laughs> But I really appreciate your kind words, and it is a special treat for me to be here this evening to introduce an extraordinary individual who is also uh, our keynote speaker uh, this evening's program. And it's hard to imagine someone who can be more fitting for a colloquium that is intended to help shape and understand a new American foreign policy, multiple voices, global voices, multiple challenges, and multiple opportunities. Our speaker tonight, Jorge Castaneda, is the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. He is a graduate of Princeton University. He did his doctorate in Paris, at the University of Paris and at the Sorbonne. He is an individual who has written a number of books ranging on topics of economics and justice and politics and foreign affairs, numerous articles. He is someone who has a deep understanding of both the practicalities and the principles of foreign affairs. He represents, for me, the kind of person for whom we must all be grateful has taken up the responsibility of public service in a complicated world. His topic tonight is the future of U.S.-Mexico relations. Please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Jorge Castaneda. Thank you very much, Provost, for the very kind words, all two minutes of them. Uh, um, I was mentioning to uh, the Mexican students whom, with whom we had a short meeting just before we <clears throat> started here that um, I really was terribly disappointed in them that they had nothing better to do on a beautiful Friday afternoon in spring in Cambridge than to come to listen to things about Mexican foreign policy and the future of U.S.-American relations. But it's, it speaks better about them than it does about my own opinions of what to do with free time. <laughs> what, what I thought I'd like to do for the half hour or so I'd like to speak before we can move on to a discussion period, because I know I'm sure from many of the faces I see there's a lot of questions or a lot of <clears throat> issues others would like to raise, is to try to give you a sense of where we would like to go in Mexico on uh, U.S.-Mexican relations over the next six years. Uh, the agenda that the President has laid out, the ideas we have, and also some of the broader sort of <clears throat> general traits of the mechanics of the foreign policy and the relations with the United States that we're trying uh, to implement. So I'd like to divide this into two parts. First, the broad lines that are not specifically linked to the United States, although obviously they are uh, in part, and then the specific points on the agenda, on the U.S.-Mexican agenda that we want to address. In this first category, perhaps the first point to emphasize is that clearly 
uh, the president has decided, and he did this from the campaign on, but certainly from the transition period onward, that he wants, to the extent that this is possible, to set the agenda. He does not want to, be, to have Mexico passively accept uh, an agenda imposed either by the United States or by events themselves. With a few exceptions in the past, uh, this has not been the case. One of the exceptions perhaps was the NAFTA period with Salinas when up to a point it was a Mexico-driven agenda that was uh, between the two countries to the extent that, so far as we know, NAFTA was something that was proposed by the Mexicans. Supposing that were the case, that would be an exception. But with that exception aside, in fact, most of the time the agenda is set either by events themselves <clears throat> or by the United States. Uh, what President-elect Fox decided to do from the very beginning and has continued to do in his first five months in office is to try to the extent that this is possible to have Mexico set the agenda or in any case to play a much more active role than setting the agenda. It would be illusory, obviously, it would be silly to think that given the asymmetry in power and size and everything else between Mexico and the United States, that Mexico can impose its agenda on the United States. But it is feasible for a series of political reasons that occur, that exist in this current window of opportunity, for Mexico to play a much more active role in setting that agenda. And I think this is a, an important issue, perhaps the most important feature of the uh, novelty in foreign policy or in managing the relationship with the United States that President Fox has attempted to establish. The most obvious uh, aspect of this is, of course, the migration issue, but there are others also. Um, that is, there's a constant exchange between the two governments on what the agenda should be. It's not just Mexico reacting to an agenda established, as I said, by events or by the United States. A second trait is that Mexico wants to broaden the bilateral agenda, to have it move beyond strictly bilateral <clears throat> issues. If you an example of this and both the difficulty and the importance of this, as I'm sure you know, having read the papers today, um, the United States uh, will not be participating in the UN Human Rights Commission for this year at least. The reason is, of course, that it was not, did not get sufficient votes to be one of the three uh, Western and other countries uh, that, were, that are elected each year. One of the reasons it didn't get the votes, one, there are many, but one of the reasons is that uh, they didn't go about trying to round up the votes soon enough or quickly enough. They asked us for our vote about a week ago. Uh, the outgoing the Cedillo regime had already committed one vote, and we committed two, the two additional votes uh, four months ago. You can't go around asking for votes on these things uh, quarter to midnight. It doesn't work. What we told uh, uh, Colin Powell was that you know, we, we really were very, very sorry that we could not uh, support the United States only because we had previously committed our votes in writing to other European countries that we would have wanted to, and we thought it's absurd that the United States not be a member of the Commission, but that the way to go about this in the future is for Mexico and the United States to establish a dialogue on candidacies, on commissions, on memberships in the different UN and regional agencies. Now, the United States doesn't horse, horse trade. Well, that's fine. A lot of countries don't horse trade. But even if you don't horse trade, you can talk about these things and you can ask for votes previously and you can reach agreements on candidacies, on votes, on memberships and on substance previously. This is what I mean with a very specific example, which is not necessarily the most important one, in broadening the agenda. Taking the U.S.-Mexican agenda beyond the strictly bilateral issues where it has been largely concentrated over the years, perhaps with some um, some exceptions, the Central American years of the 1980s, but by and large, the agenda has been limited to bilateral issues. We want to broaden it beyond the bilateral uh, area. Uh, this is mainly occurring in relation to issues such as Colombia, such as the situation in Venezuela, such as FTAA, uh, recently at Quebec, but others as well. 
How far can this go? Well, you know, again, it would be illusory for Mexico to believe all of a sudden that it has anything to say to the United States on many of the issues, on most of the issues that the United States engages countries with all over the world. But there are a number of important non-bilateral issues on which Mexico does have something to say. Uh, there are risks involved in this, of course. It is not a simple matter to, <clears throat> to pursue because you can get find yourself in all sorts of complicated situations. But by and large, the decision the president has made is that he does want to broaden the US-Mexican agenda beyond the strictly bilateral area. Thirdly, we want to link the agenda and the management of US-Mexican relations much more directly to development in Mexico and to what we could call the overall welfare of the Mexican people. Um, in Mexico, this has sometimes been referred to as shifting from a defense of principles to a defense of interests. That's one way of putting it. Many of my Mexican colleagues don't like it to be put that way. Um, there are perhaps better ways. But the fact is that the notion is to make a much more direct link between what Mexico tries to do abroad and in relations with the United States and the direct impact of that on the Mexican people, not necessarily all of the people all of the time, but at least some of the people some of the time. So you use political capital and you use your access and you use what you have to try and resolve specific issues which can be important. For another example of this is what has been going on the last month or so between the two countries regarding the situation of Section 245 of the Immigration Act. The United States, as you know, uh, President Bush on earlier this week sent a letter to the Congress asking the Congress to uh, extend for a period of time, an indefinite period of time that was not established, uh, the so-called Life Act. Uh, one of the reasons, he has many I'm sure, but one of the reasons that he did this was the fact that the Mexican government had been requesting and pushing and trying to convince the administration to do so for at least a month, more than a month now because we had information from the very beginning that we simply were unable to deliver the paperwork to our folks in the United States so that they could then go to INS offices and get their stuff done. In order to register, you need to have Mexican papers, obviously, if you're Mexican. You can also get Mexican papers sometimes when you're not Mexican, but that's a different <laughs> issue. Um, and we realized very clearly that we were unable to do it. We are now <clears throat> um, canding out, I think, the number, last number I saw, more than 300 passports a day just in New York, just in New York City at our consulate there. We've had a tremendous rush in demand for Mexican documents oh, since December because of the perception, sometimes accurate, sometimes inaccurate, that the uh, changes in the immigration law at the end of December, 245 in particular, meant that with Mexican papers, you could begin a process of documentation. Well, again, to get back to the point I wanted to make, we want to link Mexican policy in U.S.-Mexican relations as directly as possible to specific issues that matter in Mexico. This is a very narrow one. The broader one will undoubtedly come if and when uh, very ambitious and complex negotiations on energy and infrastructure begin if they do, when they do. But clearly there is an area there where we will have to find ways to use what President Fox has called Mexico's democracy bonus or democracy premium directly for the benefit of Mexican economic development and to use this as quickly as possible because it's not going to last <clears throat> forever. A fourth issue, which is a last one in general terms, is perhaps, I wouldn't say a negative one, but it's a complicating one. I think these first three broad lines are going to make Mexican management of U.S.-Mexican relations and Mexican policy towards the United States easier, more ambitious, all, not always obtaining the results one would like, always, uh, not always getting everything you want, but by and large, I think these are very positive features. The fourth one is a fact of life. You can find it positive or not. I most of the time find it to be a pain in the neck, though I would never say so in public, of course. Um, we need to socialize our agenda in Mexico. Mexico today is a country where 
issues of foreign policy are being talked about and discussed and debated in a way that had never occurred before. We have a Congress we have, a, we have to deal with. We have a Senate, we have a House, we have political parties, we have a press that is more actively engaged than ever before in foreign policy issues. Part of this is just political <clears throat> infighting. It's uh, the logical, normal give and take of the democratic changes that have taken part, place in Mexico. That's the positive part. A uh, part of it is the effort by the opposition in Mexico and also by the president's own party up to a point to find ways to assert themselves uh, in, the, in a situation where you have an immensely popular president who does not have the power of his popularity and who probably will not have the power of his popularity. And so that opens up a vacuum where a lot of people want to assert themselves, and one area where they can is foreign policy. You have from the sensible and logical and very positive aspects such as having Mexican senators and state governors from other parties involved in the immigration negotiations with the United States. State governors in Mexico are playing an increasingly important role in immigration to the United States. They're cutting their own deals with employers in the United States and with U.S. consulates to get H-2A and H-2B visas. The governor of Zacatecas, the governor of Guanajuato, the traditionally expelling states, the four big ones and the new ones, are all cutting their own deals. It's important to bring them into the negotiating process. We're doing this. This gives us a lot more strength, a lot more uh, conviction, a lot more legitimacy in our negotiations with the administration in Washington on these issues. Uh, the more complicated part is, for example, when uh, you have resolutions in the Mexican Senate trying to tell the executive how to vote at the UN. Uh, that's not going to work. You imagine if Jesse Helms wanted to tell the U executive in the States how to vote ex ante. It's one thing not to like a vote ex post. It's a totally different thing ex ante. It's impossible. The Mexican Senate can't agree on anything. How are they going to agree on how to tell us how to vote? Uh, it's a very complicated process. It's a very difficult area. And this is going to complicate relations with the United States. I think it's for the better. But there will be times when undoubtedly it will not be for the better. And this is one of these traits of Mexican foreign policy and relations with the United States that is going to be complicated. And we're going to have to try and address little by little, uh, taking into account the fact that the Mexican elites have traditionally handed over management of foreign policy to the government. These are not issues. You have a ter tremendously cosmopolitan and well-informed foreign policy and elite in Mexico in terms of intellectual curiosity and information, but not so much in terms of involvement. Traditionally, the position has been, let the government do it. We're not interested in this stuff. It's none of our business. Now that it is, there is a bit of a problem of information, of uh, preparedness, et cetera. I think we're going to be able to move forward on it, but that part is going to com complicate matters to some extent. Now I'd like to go very quickly into the specific issues of the relationship and how we try <clears throat> to view them in the future. Whether we will succeed on all of these fronts, I think, is less important, given what I've tried to say so far, than the fact that this is what the president wants to do. I'm not sure, rather I am sure, we will not get everything we are attempting to get on each one of these points. I think the important aspect is to, for it to be clear that I think for the first time we have a broad, ambitious, well thought out agenda that we're trying to move forward together to uh, consolidate. On migration, first of all, we, we believe <clears throat> the president knows because he's from an immigration state and is familiar with the issue that uh, this is an issue that is going to last for another 15 years or so and then will begin to become less important, f essentially for demographic and partly for economic reasons. And so we have really a problem for that period of time, and we have to be able to find a way to engage the Americans on these issues for that period of time. We found an incredibly receptive attitude on the part of the Bush administration. And at this stage, we think we can move rather quickly forward on the fronts, the four fronts that the president set out from the very beginning as the ones he wants Mexico to move forward on in its negotiations with the United States. The first one has to do with the situation on the border, that there is simply too much violence. There are too many incidents on the border 
which are of an unacceptable nature to both countries and to both governments. This ranges from um, executions or assassinations of undocumented Mexicans by ranchers, ranchers or border patrol or local police. That's the small minority of the cases. Those are not very many, but any one of them is too many. To the growing number of deaths on the border because of the adverse terrain or hostile envir environment through which people have been forced to cross the last four or five years since INS began building fences and using this balloon phenomenon of pushing people away from the easier places to cross into the more difficult ones. If we take the whole gamut of issues at the border, violence, fences, smugglers, coyotes, corruption, etc. This is an area that requires attention. We've begun to have a specific group with the United States on these issues. They'll be meeting in, in El Paso in a couple of weeks, I think, the second meeting, or I don't recall exactly when. And the Americans, although they've been very forthcoming on this in the past, in principle, are now much more forthcoming in fact, and we think we've been able to really begin to move forward on this quickly. The second issue on immigration has to do with what some Americans call amnesty, what we call regularization, and what increasingly we're probably going to end up calling documentation, which has to do with the situation of Mexicans currently in the United States without papers, either here permanently without papers or here on a temporary basis without papers. This is obviously a very complicated issue because it's the single most touchy or delicate domestic issue in the United States. The fact that the United States, that the Bush administration has accepted to place this issue on the bilateral agenda is an enormous change. Alan knows this from his time in Mexico better than anyone. The traditional U.S. stance has been, frankly, it's none of your damn business. U.S. immigration law is made by the Congress. It's applied by INS, and if you like it, fine. If you don't like it, that's too bad. This is not something that we, the United States, negotiates with with other countries. The fact that at least the principle has now been accepted is an enormous change. But in addition to having the principle accepted, we're actually moving forward on the substance. And we're moving forward on the substance because uh, the Bush administration is sensible and sensitive on this issue. They read the numbers like everyone else. Uh, they also read the politics of it very sensibly. And we've begun to make serious progress on this front. How far this will take us, whether we'll be able to get it through the Congress here or not when we have a deal, whether that deal would fly with the Latino community and the unions or not. All of these are questions that are out there still floating. But the enormous change is that we are now negotiating on these issues and actually moving forward on them very specifically. The third one has to do with temporary visas or temporary worker programs, which we have decided from the very beginning, regardless of what other people may say at any one point, to link inextricably with the point I just mentioned of documentation or regularization. As Mexico knows, it cannot accept any deal on guest workers that also doesn't also include a deal on uh, documentation. And we have used the trade negotiation um, metaphor of the single undertaking to make it clear to the United States administration what our global framework is. If there is an agreement on the border, on violence and how to address the issue at the border, on documentation, on guest worker programs and on the fourth point of for permanent visas, which is the easiest one, then Mexico is willing in the context of that single undertaking to share responsibility with the United States in managing the flow of immigration between Mexico and the United States over the next 10 or 15 years. <coughs> Defining what that shared responsibility means exactly is something that will have to be done in the future. And that is something that has to be part of the negotiation. But as a matter of principle, this is a decision that the president has taken. It's the reason why he has included uh, the Secretary of the Interior, Santiago Krill, as co-head of the Mexican negotiating team with Secretary Powell and Attorney General Ashcroft. And it is a central issue of how we want to look at this relationship in the future. We think that it, we can reach 
an agreement with the United States that will be enormously beneficial to millions of Mexicans and that will, in a sense, lay this issue, I wouldn't say to rest, but make it much more manageable for these next 15 years, after which it will cease to be an issue. It will still exist, but it will not be a problem, or at least that's the estimate most of the demographers are making, and we have no reason to believe that they are mistaken. The, uh, the second specific area is the non-bilateral issues. As I said, they're mainly Latin American in nature. Some of them are multilateral. Perhaps up to this point, the most important ones have been Colombia and Venezuela. In the case of Venezuela, it's much more a personal situation than a substantive one um, for reasons that uh, do not require too many explanations of the um, diplomatic type that I generally give and get into trouble for. Um, it's not obvious to the people in Washington how to establish a constructive relationship with President Chavez. Um, they believe, and we believe, and President Cardoso in Brazil believes, that there are Latin American leaders who are probably better placed to have a constructive dialogue and engagement with President Chavez than people in Washington. Um, and we are be, we've been trying to do this, in our case, since December 1st, in the case of President Cardoso, for the last three years. Um, sometimes more progress is made than others. Sometimes some things are easier than others. But in general terms, I think that in the case of Venezuela, um, the fact that people like President Cardoso, like President Fox, have established a close personal relationship with Chavez means that there is always of someone there listening and speaking so that the types of situations that existed with other countries in other moments and other leaders do not emerge again. And I think we've made some progress there, but I would insist this is less substantive for the moment than of a personal nature. Where things are much more substantive than personal is in the case of Colombia, which does not mean that anybody knows exactly what to do. But it does mean that Clearly, it's important for Colombia, for Latin America, and for the United States that countries like Mexico play a more active role in trying to find solutions to the conflicts in Colombia. The situation in Colombia is not easy at all. Um, the electoral campaign having started now for practical purposes being in full, full swing means that everything is going to be for the next year decided or touched upon electorally which means that the peace process runs the risk of either collapsing or of becoming a, a campaign issue in such a way that any continuity in the peace process would begin to be put into question precisely because of the type of politicking that would logically go on during a campaign. If all of the candidates campaign against the peace process, the most logical thing to happen to the peace process is that it, it disintegrate. If that happens and the new president of Colombia whoever he or she may be, uh, is not, does not find himself or herself in a situation where she is bound, uh, or is, he is bound by the previous inertia or commitments to the peace process, um, it is not at all impossible that given the growth of the paramilitary groups and given the strength of the guerrilla groups and given the collapse in this hypothesis of the peace process, um, that full-fledged civil war could erupt in that country. And this is not something that we are saying, it's something that the Colombians tell us. President Pastrana, the candidates running for government, uh, for office, Commissioner Camilo Gomez, all of them say essentially the same thing. We think we can be useful. We're trying to be as active as possible, both in Bogota, in San Vicente, and in international meetings such as one in Brussels just last week on the situation in Colombia with other countries. It's a very difficult uh, mediation to pursue because it's not entirely clear that the parties want an international mediation. Um, it's not entirely clear that if they wanted one, they want Mexico to get involved in it. Though at this stage, we probably are more familiar with the situation and have more to suggest and to work on it than anybody else does. Perhaps the Canadians and the Spanish would also be in that situation. It's very difficult because Brazil, which is a logical candidate to be involved, does not want to. So, but these are some of the issues in this non-bilateral approach that we're trying to move forward on. Thirdly and rapidly, drugs. We've made a lot of progress, we think, 
in removing the issue of certification from the agenda, making it a non-issue for the moment. Uh, we hope that the Senate will pass the suspension of certification for three years and the sort of turning it around without a congressional, uh, without congressional response for three years soon. If the Senate passes this and the fact that it was approved unanimously in Foreign Relations Committee means it probably will pass it almost unanimously very soon. We think we can get it through the House in the next, by, by the fall or by the summer recess. That would mean that we would have that out of the way and on the one hand be able to move forward on strengthening and substituting the certification process with a multilateral mechanism, the foundations of which already exist in the OAS, insufficient and limited and narrow, but there's something to work on there. And at the same time trying, without that issue pending, to deal with the United States on the whole area of uh, drug enforcement issues in a much more rational and orderly way. It's not easy. We're trying, we're pushing hard, for example, to have the Americans accept that we do a joint review of all the different forms of cooperation because what has happened over the last 10 or 15 years is a proliferation of agencies on the Mexican side and on the American side, each one cutting their own deals, each one sharing intelligence, information, complicities, accusations, and everything else one by one and nobody having the whole picture and each American agency liking it that way and each Mexican agency liking it that way. But this being to the detriment of both governments as governments and to the detriment of the drug enforcement process. It's very difficult to move forward on this because there are real interests involved, intelligence sharing interests, uh, presence in Mexico, budgetary constraints, all sorts of areas. But we're making some progress there and we think we'll be able to move forward uh, in the coming months on that front. I don't want to spend too much time on drugs because I think one of the big changes we've been able to introduce into the relationship these last five months is to denarcotize the relationship. The two presidents and the two governments speak less and less about drugs and more and more about other issues, and I think that's a very positive development. To give you an example, just yesterday in the very brief uh, courtesy but very substantive conversation that Presidents Fox and Bush had at the White House for the 40 minutes that they talked. If I'm not mistaken, the drug issue didn't come up once, which was, un this is unheard of given the way things used to be in the 80s and 90s and as recently probably as last year. They talked about avocados, they talked about sugar, they talked about Colombia, they talked about the United Nations, they talked about energy, they talked about Section 245 of the immigration law, they talked about all sorts of things, but they did not talk about drugs. And this is something which is very new, and I think very positive. Uh, next to last, energy. I don't want to come back to this, I mentioned it a little bit before. For whatever reasons, clearly there is a totally different position in the U.S. on energy than there was in the past to the extent that many of the considerations that existed in Mexico in the last administration about power, electrical power, for example, have become meaningless. The reason President Cedillo wanted to change Mexico's legislation on electric power was that he believed that with the existing legislation it would be impossible to attract sufficient foreign investment into electric power in order to be able to comply with Mexico's demand over the next 20 years. Um, the way President Bush is presenting the situation, that's irrelevant today. There is such enormous demand in the United States for Mexican and Canadian energy, and there is such an energy crisis in the United States today, that it's not a question of investment in Mexico. You can get the investment any old way you want. That is not the issue anymore. That doesn't mean that Mexico shouldn't change its uh, legislation. I'm, I think we're going to do, try and do it anyway but it does mean that the situation really has changed. The energy crisis in the United States is placing the entire energy relationship in a different situation. Where this will go, I don't know yet. I think there's a lot of ideas being thrown around in Mexico and in the United States and in Canada on this issue, but clearly this is gonna become perhaps the central issue together with immigration in the bilateral relationship over the next four or five years. And finally, trade, just to use as an example of what I meant before, 
of President Fox wanting to use the relationship as much as possible to improve the situation for specific Mexican groups. He calls each one of his uh, ministers before um, his meetings with President Bush. He said, what do you got? And each one comes up with whatever they have their Christmas list, their wish list. And some things are important and some things are not. But he goes through them, he orders them, he analyzes them, and he brings them up with Bush each time around. And he gets some things on some of them and he doesn't on others. And he knows that each one of the small things of this nature that he brings up, President Bush is going to come back at him with one of his own. But for different reasons, President Fox isn't scared of that. He says, I want my uh, aguacates. And it's a, I got a problem with aguacates, and you have to help me with the aguacates. And he knows Bush is going to come back and, yeah, but what about the water in the Rio Bravo? You haven't paid for seven years. You owe us so many tons of water. And so Fox will say, that's fine. We do, and we're going to work on that. But you have to help me on the sugar because we've got this enormous problem on sugar. You guys are not complying with, with NAFTA. You're not complying even with the side agreements, which were illegal anyway. So, uh, you know, and this goes on and on and on. And it's, I think it's the way it should be. They shouldn't spend all of their time on these issues. But it is important that at a presidential level, some of these trade issues be put forward because they are important. They're directly important to the aguacate producers in Uruapan, to the cañeros and the sugar producers, mainly in Veracruz and other states. Uh, they're important to different sectors in Mexico. To a, to a large extent, this is what everybody else does. We were very surprised, and I'll end on this note, when we uh, went, uh, when President-elect Fox went to France in, in September, and in October, and all of the French officials before kept telling us, you, know, you have to be very careful because uh, the Mexican government has signed a contract with Matra, the French arms producer, uh, to sell a huge amount of communications, encryption com equipment to Mexico, the police force and the army. And now everyone is saying, Motorola is going around saying that the French, that Mexico is going to back off, that Fox is going to back off because Motorola has a huge plant in Jalisco, which is a pan state, and another huge plant in Guanajuato, which is, of course, Fox's state. Blah, 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 blah. As I say, come on, this is not serious. President Chirac is not going to bring up this nonsense. I mean, this is important, but it's a big deal. Well, they were right. <laughs> the first thing President Chirac came up with during the conversation is, well, it's good to meet you here in Paris. I'm glad you're here. Mexico, France, Cinco de Mayo, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but um, what about the contract for the communications equipment? That's the way governments do these things, and there is no reason in the world why Mexico shouldn't. I've rambled on too long. I'm sorry, but we'll have some time for questions. Thank you very much, but I tried to share with you some sort of a vision of we want, where we want to go. Thanks a lot. There's a line over there, Alan. But for you can <laughs> please go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that um, very um, illustrative and sincere talk. Um, my talk is, my question is really on what are we doing in terms of what is actually going to change the situation of Mexico, even though the avocados and the you know, situation in Guanajuato can be important. If we don't get into education, science and technology, we're not going to move from where we are. So what are the initiatives from the government in terms of university agreements, in terms of research, laboratories, science and technology, issues that can really change the situation of Mexico as opposed to what we've been doing for the last maybe 50, 60, 70, 100 years? Well, um, firstly, although I agree absolutely with the thrust of your question, it is not, strictly speaking, my brief. Um, people said it should have been, but anyway, it's not. Um, so it's not, a, 
it's not really what I'm involved in and the international aspects and the U.S.-Mexican aspects of education, science, and technology, as important as they are, uh, can only come and help the domestic effort that has to be done at the Ministry of Education and at CONACYT. What we're trying to do is to establish as many agreements as possible at the state level in the United States and also at the federal level with Alan, we're working on some of these ideas. Um, when President Fox went to California about a month ago, many of the activities that were programmed for his trip there had specifically to do with education, partly with the education of Mexicans in California, but partly also with education agreements, cooperation agreements between the UC system or other areas in California and Mexico. We have to do much more on this, but it's there, there are always budgetary problems there. Who pays? The agreements always cost money. Somebody's got to put up the money. And you, the kind of agreements you get are the ones generally that don't come with money. But I agree certainly with the thrust of your question. Yes, Mr. Secretary, um, drugs are uh, an uh, international health problem. And uh, <clears throat> The criminal uh, procedure, cr criminal process that worldwide has, has, um, hasn't worked. What is your opinion on legalizing uh, marijuana, cocaine, and heroin to uh, deal with the international health problem? We spend so much money on uh, the criminal part of it. The, the position of the government on this issue is very clear. President Fox has been very specific and explicit on this. Uh, he opposes and will not um, support any form of legalization as part of an international uh, strategy. Uh, he has acknowledged on several occasions that the situation in Mexico is different from the situation that exists in other countries and that perhaps the more tolerant legislation and the least penalizing or punitive type of legislation and more harm reduction oriented legislation that exists in Mexico today that he was handed is perhaps a more sensible and reasonable way to go. But that is just an opinion regarding the legislation that exists in his country, period. This is not an issue or a banner or a cause that the current government of Mexico is going to be able to espouse in the near future. Yeah, most of the countries legalize uh, um, alcohol and tobacco, and that's probably the worst drugs. As I said, I mean, there's a fascinating intellectual debate about the issue, but the position of the government is very clear on the matter. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Castaneda, regarding the welfare aspect of the Mexican agenda that you mentioned, what specific strategies or policies are being conceived in order to regulate the working conditions of the Mexican people from the maquiladora sector? The, the, the president's position on this issue in general terms is that the absolutely indispensable improvement of labor conditions, wages, rights, in the maquiladora sector, but everywhere in Mexico, in Mexican industry, is something that has to be brought about essentially by the workers themselves. What the government can do is to create conditions in which they can fight more effectively for those rights and to change many of the unacceptable features of this working conditions in the maquiladoras. There is an international aspect to that, which has to do both with the way the NAFTA side agreements and the NAFTA panels on labor issues work, and they have not worked well. Uh, the example of the situation in the famous duro bag of Maquiladora and Matamoros or in Rio Bravo is, is not a good example. It has not worked well. Um, there is also the issue of what type of labor standards or labor agreements will be tacked on to FTAA in the negotiations between now and 2005. And there is also the type of uh, agreements that increasingly will have to be negotiated I, at the ILO in Geneva in the context of a new round of trade talks at the WTO after the Qatar meeting in November. We want to be active on all of this because Fox knows that he can use international 
commitments and pressure to bring about change in Mexico. It's not just for the hell of it. Um, like the human rights issues are not just for the hell of it. It's because these are very powerful and effective instruments to bring about change in Mexico. But it's also true that we in Mexico, because of NAFTA, are not entirely in a very strong international position on these matters. The Latin Americans, for example, say, yeah, it's easy for you guys to go around talking about the environment and labor and sunshine and civil society and all this stuff, because you already are committed to that because of NAFTA. What you're trying to do is to foist upon us, say the Latin Americans, what the Americans and Canadians foisted upon you back in 93. And who the hell are you to come and tell us about what we should be doing with our, the trees in southern Chile or whatever? Um, so it's, it's not an easy tactic to use. But clearly, the, the intention is to try, this is what we can do with the foreign ministry at least, is to use international instruments as much as possible to bring about pressure and change domestically in these areas. It's a slow process. And needless to say, the situation of the Mexican labor movement doesn't particularly help. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for articulating the agreements. Uh, wealth of a nation, of any nation, depends on the health of her citizens. Uh, you articulated, I think, uh, health care it seems to be a very sensible, sensitive, and very simple in context of shared responsibility, purpose, and relationship in cementing the Latin American friendship, which President Bush has articulated. My question to you is, has there any been dialogue with Secretary of Human Health Services, Mr. Mr. Governor Tommy Thompson, about, about the health issue? where we can, you can get some help from the technology and uh, benefit of the health care of this country. Well, uh, we were talking just before we met with the provost here that uh, we have now the luxury of having, I think, perhaps one of the most competent and uh, recognized health ministers Mexico has had in many, many years, if not ever, in, in Julio Frank, who is an official of the WHO in Geneva, who's a fellow here at Harvard for many years and who really uh, knows the health issue in Mexico as probably very few of his predecessors have. Um, and he's being very active by definition in trying to use his international contacts, experience, connections to try and change what is uh, certainly not a very rosy picture of the health situation in Mexico. Again, these are these are issues that are complicated to deal with on the basis of international cooperation because they all have very significant budgetary impacts. And it's easier to, cut, to reach an agreement with the United States or with the WHO or whoever on health cooperation if there is no money involved than if there is money involved. But if there is no money involved, it's less attractive, it's less effective, it's less interesting. But certainly it's an area where there's going to be a lot of movement Particularly, there's going to be a lot of movement now in California in having specific health programs for Mexican migrants in the United States. That's a little more doable. And it's immensely important in Mexico because if we're able to reestablish the circularity of people going, coming and going and have health programs for them in the United States, well, we are dealing with the health of Mexicans regardless of where they are, whether they're in uh, in the valley, in the San Joaquin Valley, or whether they're in Michoacan. Um, it's not enough, but it's certainly one of the efforts that we're making. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dulce Carrillo, uh, Mexican national from Guadalajara, and now at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Um, first of all, I want to thank you very much for your very clear uh, speech, which I understood very, very well, I think, thanks to taking Professor Alan Sussman's course this, this semester in which we talked about these issues. Uh, my question is regarding, regarding uh, the disparity of wealth in Mexico, and I would like to know your comments about how NAFTA and the broadening or extending of NAFTA even to an FTAA, how that, how, what Mexico will do so that the trade that we get and, and our commercial uh, relations 
affect the shrinking of disparity in wealth? Well, the, the, the president's position on the issue, I think, has been very clear from before, from the campaign and during these first months in office. Um, he, clearly, he believes that the free trade agreement has brought a lot of <clears throat> trade and investment and jobs to Mexico, but has also widened gaps of a regional nature, of a social and wage nature in Mexico, and that a series of additions have to be tacked on to NAFTA uh, in order for those disparities which existed before NAFTA, but which perhaps have gotten worse together with the improvements that NAFTA has also brought, have to be addressed. And that's why he has been so insistent on the issue of social cohesion funds, of infrastructure funds, of education, and of tacking, and of course of immigration, and of tacking all of these issues, attaching them to NAFTA in one way or another. The initial reaction on the part of the Bush administration was obviously skeptical, as it had been on the part of Bush one administration back in 90, 91. Not that the Salinas administration pressed too much on this, and that also there was skepticism on the part of the Clinton administration. Um, there has been movement on this. Uh, President Bush was much less skeptical in Quebec, for in Quebec City, for example, on the broader issues of seeing FTAA as something more than just a trade agreement than he might have been a few months ago. And in the specific talks with Mexico, and now with Canada also on some of these matters, uh, I think a lot of progress has been made. Whether it's the, the money and the measures themselves or the symbolic nature of some steps to be taken, which can then be built on later, which will be more important, we'll have to see. But I think it's, it's very clear to President Fox that the enormous and growing disparities in Mexico of all types have to be addressed at the highest level. And if the highest level is NAFTA, then that's where they have to be addressed. But that these are not things that can be just left to the market to fix. The market is not going to fix them. And I think that that is a very important change in relation to the previous attitudes regarding NAFTA. After that commercial break, Jorge, I'd like to ask a question that's been bugging me for some time. When we negotiated NAFTA, and I was in the embassy, we expected to have some significant impact on the border infrastructure problem. We thought that there'd be a lot of private funds coming in, there was NAD Bank that would help, and in fact, it's been a disaster. The border has gone from really bad to absolutely degenerate. Uh, the infrastructure is awful, the health conditions are bad, the, the problem of violence has gotten worse, and it seems no end in sight, but there's a sense that if something isn't done soon, it's going to be uh, an explosive situation in some sense. Some of us believe that that's, that possibility of progress is, is really connected to fiscal reform in Mexico, the opportunity to build resources in a significant way to address these border issues on a bilateral, more or less equal basis. Do you have any ideas, even though this is not one of the hats you're necessarily aware of, the prospects for fiscal reform and how one might be able to address on a bilateral basis this critical problem of infrastructure on the border? Well, I'd say two things, Alan. Firstly, I mean, um, even if we could get significant, prompt, effective fiscal reform, it would not be easy to channel the money to the border because by Mexican standards, the border is a very prosperous, rich area of the country. And there's no way that the governors of the, the other tw no, 28 governors are going to let the president get away with channeling the resources that he's squeezing from other areas of the country into Ciudad Juarez and Brown and Matamoros and Tijuana and uh, Mexicali, which are as bad as you say. I mean, your description I subscribe to completely, but it's still a lot better than the situation that exists in Oaxaca or in Guerrero or in Hidalgo or Chiapas, needless to say. And so we have that basic problem. That's why the president has been so insistent on saying that financing for not just the border, but the broader bilateral issues has to come at least partly from the United States. We're not going to be able to do it on our own. We can make an effort. We're going to make an effort. We're making an effort. But 
it's just not possible to handle the, the magnitude of the problems involved at the border and the resources that are necessary with Mexico's situation. The second aspect of your question, which is what are the prospects for fiscal reform or tax reform right now, I think we're going to get a good reform by the, by the summer. Um, I would have preferred to have gotten it in this last period, but you know, this is one of the issues involving Congress in Mexico. Congress in Mexico is in session four and a half months a year. Now, there's a limit to what you can get done <laughs> in four and a half months a year. Um, this last session, the second, the, the, the second session, um, the, actually, it's the first session of the year, is one month long. Um, and one month, um, it's a month of Sundays. I mean, uh, these, you know, the Mondays, the Fridays they go home, and Mondays is San Lunes. And it's, <laughs> it's very difficult. I mean, the Congress is not set up to work in Mexico the way a Congress has to work, because that's not what it was for. It was a rubber stamp body that received laws from the presidency, approved them, and sent them on. And now they actually have to work on them and reach negotiations and compromise. And they're doing their best, but it's not set up in a way for this to be a, an effective process. So uh, I, I think we'll get tax reform by September, over the summer. Um, I don't think we will get the tax reform the president wants, all of it. We'll get a substantial part of it. Um, will it be as revenue significant as he wants? And if it's not, is it worth it? At this stage, yes. Um, it has to be done. How much money there will be in it at the end of the day is open to question, like everything that you do with Congress. We'll have to see. But certainly on the border, I mean, this is the key issue. And I must say, I mean, President Bush's attitude on that bank has changed enormously uh, since the first meeting we had with him in August as a candidate. He's, I mean, he's now more or less a situation. This, this exists, let's use it. Let's fix it, agreeing totally with what you say. It's been a disaster. But let's try and fix an existing institution. I, I'm being told that I, we have to go because, so I'm supposed to say, in addition to leaving, I'm supposed to welcome everybody to Cinco de Mayo party that begins here as soon as the balloons fall, and, uh, and thank those who are having the uh, occasion here after us for having had the patience to uh, uh, listen to all of this for a while and hope that you all have a very, very Feliz Cinco de Mayo. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but <laughs> with the balloons and, and unas chelas, I think it'll work out very well. Happy Cinco de Mayo, and thank you very much.